Okay, I think we are finally set up. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. These technical things always mm, kind of very strange things at the, at the very end. So um, we're very happy to, to have Sam Michael Abilla speak for us this afternoon. Um, well, uh, Sam Michael Abilla was himself a PhD student at Cambridge many years ago in the 50s. <laughs> and he later became professor first in Oxford and later in, in Cambridge, he was actually Master of Trinity College in, in Cambridge. And in, the, in 1997, he came to Edinburgh as an honorary professor. So, well, as you know, St. Michael Abilia's works uh, have been very, very influential and, well, they have been, the, the range of topics is really amazing. So when his collective works were first published, um, I think it was in the 90s, if I'm right, it was already six volumes. And if it were to be published again, it would have some seventh volume already. So it's a very, very productive mathematical life. Uh, he also has very distinguished prizes, like the Fifth Medal, and he also has an other prize for his collaboration with uh, Singer. And well, very recently we have had his uh, Lily. Atilla and Michael, that's the Michael Atilla Portrait Gallery, uh, inaugurated in the in JCMB, but we are, we are having the conference. And well, I was very glad this morning to see some of you already playing with the gallery and pressing buttons, checking out all the mathematicians, and it's, I mean, it has been a, a real huge project uh, that has been developed during this year. And it was um, inaugurated on St. Michael's birthday, which was uh, quite recently. So, well, this lecture is going to be a little bit about all the mathematicians in, in the gallery. And I hope that you will, you will enjoy it and that you will enjoy continuing playing with the gallery during the breaks. So, up to Michael Adija. Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you for solving all the technical problems and the fair guests. Half the team assistants. Uh, it's very nice to be addressing a group of young mathematicians who, of course, are the people who will push forward the frontiers of mathematics uh, in the future. Um, the theme of my talk, I give it mathematicians I have known, I want to emphasize two things really. One is the historical perspective of mathematics, you know, how far back in the past it goes, the ideas. And secondly, the fact that mathematics is actually created by people. Mathematics isn't uh, always there. Every bit of mathematics had to be first thought of by some person, and then passed on and from generation to generation. So you have to think of mathematics as an ongoing operation from the past to the present, and you take it into the future. So that, and then my personal story about it, uh, the mathematicians I've known, I've known quite a lot of mathematicians, I've lived quite a long time, so I, my memory, my the mathematicians I talk about, uh, for example, I think the oldest person I, was, I met was born in 1885, already takes you back quite 150 years ago. Um, so the, the um, now in this um, mathematicians, there's a gallery of mathematics which my wife and I decided to set up for the university, which, uh, on which this talk is going to be based. The gallery, as uh, Carmen said, is it, actually on show in the third floor of the uh, Maxwell building next door, and there are a lot of nice buttons, you can press buttons and those fancy things, lights go on. Here I, this is a simple version, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I uh, hope that during the various breaks you will have time to go and explore <clears throat> and select the buttons and find out about the people there and so on. So this is a preview, so advertise, advertisement for the future film show. Um, <clears throat> now the origin of that gallery was partly the, on the ground floor, that's the second floor in terminology Clark Maxwell building, there is already a display of physicists. It's called the Max Born Collection. Max Born was a physicist, a prize winner, who was a professor in Edinburgh. In fact, my wife was the lecture many years ago. And, and uh, when he died, he, he donated to the university his collection of portraits of physicists which he had collected over his lifetime. Many famous physicists and then it's put on display in that gallery which you'll see at the floor and there they can be lit up and they look nice and that was when I came to the building and saw that I liked it so much I thought we should have one in mathematics 
I said, I said, okay, you go ahead and do it. So he went ahead and did it. And Andrew helped me a lot. And um, so it's just been opened. And then, I mean, it opened my birthday a little while back, but it's, there's some technical problems that we solved. And I'm told by the experts that it's all, all functioning beautifully now. Every month we press does the right thing. No, no, no. And it's meant to be vandal proof. No student can mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't take it as a challenge. <laughs> Uh, so that's the, that was a catalog model on the model of physicists. It's not quite the same because of physics were his personal collection. Uh, and so when we came to make our choice and acquisitions, we said, what criteria should you use? We had a limited number, 70, <coughs> 70 is quite a lot. And how do you pick 70 acquisitions from all over the world, from all periods of time? It's almost impossible. Uh, so the only criteria we, we chose was that they should all be mathematicians who I and my wife, who studied mathematics, here in Cambridge, uh, either you personally, or studied with, or perhaps even with a bit of exaggeration to people whom we admired in the past. So they're all people who are taking to us our choice. So you can't argue with that. Your choice was different. But we did it, it's our choice. And uh, of course, model is a selective choice, obviously, because there are people we knew, or uh, their mathematics reflects the mathematics that we know, so it only covers certain areas of mathematics, but uh, it's quite a wide range in terms of countries, nationalities, ages, and so on. So that it's not universal. A lot of your favorite mathematicians will not be there. By the way, the, the selection I've got here is a subset of the main film. The main film will show us 70. Here I've got about 20, because time is short. And what I'm going to do is go through some of them and talk a bit about them. I'll show you the pictures or the little text we have. I may embroider the text by adding a few extra remarks, which you don't find in the main film show yet. But that film show could be expanded later on. Um, so that's an kind of introductory blurb. Now that was just, uh, I'm ahead of shape. Okay. So, so now I have to press this button, uh, and the miracle is supposed to happen. Ah, I'm saying miracle both sides. <laughs> so this explains really what I've been telling you. The portraits are, uh, here they start, so they include many names. Some of them are classical names of the past, Archimedes, Newton, and so on, which you know, we have to have a few of those in. And then we have people who taught us in Edinburgh and in Cambridge uh, and influenced us. And but the bulk of the portraits are those of our contemporaries, uh, including some uh, collaborators and many field medalists. And uh, I, because my wife, who studied mathematics, both here and the PhD in Cambridge, uh, is a mathematician, we, she has special interest in women mathematicians, so we make quite sure that women mathematicians are well represented in that gallery, and you'll find them there, we'll include a few here. Then after that, of course, are my students. And you've been around as long as I have, you've been lots of students, and grand students, and grand mathematical generation is compactified. Like, it don't take 25 years to produce offspring. <laughs> Five years is now. <laughs> like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, these, these different categories overlap. Students become collaborators and friends, and so on. So there's no hard line division. And the main, main difficulty was how do we keep that number down to 70? When we got to 70, I was very relieved, but then I said, ah, I've forgotten old so and so. So we had to put in him, and so we have to kick somebody out. Ah, that's the hard bit. I did it a few times by doubling up, squeezing two to the same bit under some guy. You'll see if you do that. But we did it a lot. It could be modified in the future, of course, perhaps there'll be room for expansion. So that's the, the overall introduction in text. Now, I, having selected my group of 20 or so to talk about here today, I thought I had to put them in some kind of coherent groups to give them a bit of, uh, not this alphabetical list. So first of all, I pick the, the classical ones, so the ones from the past. These are people I know of, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, and I've selected them because they, are, they represent the kind of mathematics that I like and enjoy doing. I could have chosen many more. And of course, this is a subset of the main collection. So the classical one, well, I... I Started out with Euler. Picture, no, no, you see, Euler there is behind you. That's Euler, picture in here, the text of Euler. Euler was, well, you see the thing, he, he, he liked to work for emperors, empresses or emperors. So he, when, when Catherine the Great invited him to St. Petersburg, he went to St. Petersburg. When Frederick the Great invited him to Berlin, he went to Berlin. And that was about the only emperors who were around at the time. Uh, anyway, he, he, and, he, and he, Euler's name appears in almost every branch of mathematics, and even things that he invented 
we don't have his name, for example, he was the first person to produce the symbols for E and Pi. We don't call them Euler's Pi or Euler's E, it's E and Pi. Uh, and, uh, but I think I'd like to point out the, the one thing, he made he many formulas, but the one, I think the one thing he made his name on was this little formula here. The sum of 1 over n squared of integers is pi squared over 6. People, of course, knew that something 1 over n diverges. The 1 over n squared converge. It's okay, then what's the answer? And uh, this is a famous problem posed by the Bernoulli. And uh, Euler solved it and made him famous for the result of solving this formula. It's a beautiful formula. I mean, you know, if you did nothing else in mathematics, to find that formula would guarantee you uh, fame forever afterwards. But if you're the kind of guy who finds that formula, you find a lot more. <laughs> uh, I, and also you find the formula relating the exponential function to the trigonometric functions. Um, I, I think if you don't know this formula, or haven't seen it, or don't know it, I would then try to challenge, see if you can prove it. But then you're back in the 18th century, you've served the problem, and you want to make your name big. See if you can find a proof of that formula. Um, I mean, if you find a proof on your own, haven't seen it before, send me an email and you may become famous. <laughs> uh, if you can't find the formula, you can't find it yourself, uh, look it up. And there are a lot of proofs in there, beautiful proofs. But it is the beginning of the whole development of mathematics that starts with this formula. Uh, Euler, towards the end of his life, became blind, but the did started working. Uh, he had an assistant who dictated mathematics to him. He went on working right for the end of his uh, generation. He, uh, what's something missing here? Uh, Anyway, he, 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 he pub, he pub, his uh, publication ran into something like, I mean, which is now being produced, anything, something like 73 volumes. That's the amount of mathematics. He, he generally vast amount of mathematics, and that's it. They're still working on them, I think, still editing them now. So, oh, of course, I, I skipped a few of them the, in the main gallery, start with Newton, or go back to Archimedes. But here we start with what? It's a classical period of mathematics. Now, large amount of mathematics began. We go Then we move on to a different character, Abel. Niels Henrik Abel, who was Norwegian, he was the first of the new generation of Norwegians in independent Norway, essentially. He, went, he was the first uh, student and mathematician they produced, and uh, he became famous for and his name. And it's, I say, it's very, it, Actually, many things because he did many things, but also he had a kind of name that lent itself to, to, to being an adjective. A real is a nice sort of adjective. You can't make risky in that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to choose the right name to be uh, turned into an adjective. So, a real is very great. You have a real group, a real group, a real category, and they're nice and short and so it's snappy. But, it's, but it indicates the. I think Argo, I would describe as the first modern mathematician. Euler was a classical mathematician. Gauss was also a scientific period. Arvo followed Gauss, was the first really modern mathematician in the sense that he studied things in degree, degree of generality, he went to the heart of things and laid the foundation stones for mathematics of hundreds of years later. Arvo died in tuberculosis at the age of 27, very young. He, of course, became famous for having solved, shown that the quintic equation was insoluble in my radicals. Uh, and uh, just at the end of his life, he was awarded a professorship, but he wasn't too ill to take it up. And if he hadn't died in 1927, he would certainly be the successor of Gauss in mathematical terms. And even dying at a young age, he left behind a uh, work of enormous importance. And that's why his name is attached to the Arbor Prize in Norway now. So he was he's a really a famous mathematician. Right at the beginning of the 19th century, he was laying the foundation for modern mathematics. Ah, oh, yes. Beamer. So, jump into the top. Oh, oh. <laughs> and the time. Uh, now, moving on to Riemann. Riemann was. Uh, he shared with Arbol, he died young, apparently, he died in 40, of tuberculosis also. Uh, he had uh, he studied in Göttingen with Gauss. Uh, and his name is attached to many things, as you see. Riemannian manifold, Riemann surfaces, Riemann hypothesis, the Riemann rock field, and Riemann Hilbert problem. There are so many things attached to Riemann's name, it's very convenient to have a second party 
So you can distinguish between uh, which theorem you're talking about. The rock is not very well known, but it's very convenient to have a second bit. <laughs> Hilbert is well known, that's okay. But, he, but anyway, it helps to that, tell you what he worked on. He, in his main, probably most famous for developing Riemannian geometry, uh, and his work on different Riemannian geometry was as a, a challenge problem. When you take a thesis in Germany in those days until now, you were given a subsidiary topic to sort of just show that you weren't narrow specialists. And this subsidiary topic was given to him by Gauss, which was to look at the foundations of geometry. And we looked at the foundations of geometry, he invented Riemannian geometry. It was a sort of small sideline, uh, which we did in his spare time. Uh, <laughs> The foundations of an awful, awful lot of scholars to Einstein theory. Uh, um, now, unlike all this is very important when you think about transitions, they're not the same. Now, looking around the room, I can see that they're not all the same. <laughs> some old, some young, some male, some female, some brilliant, some not so brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, 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 and they all contribute in different ways. Well, Euler, I told you, produced 73 volumes. We must take the work to take one volume. But each volume, each chapter of that volume, opened an entire door of mathematics. So quality counts as much as quantity. Euler has quality as well, but uh, Riemann constantly on, on, on quality. And it's a very, very small book. I've got his delicate works. It's very wonderful. It takes an inch on the shelf space. Um, so that's, that's, now, so Riemann, I regard, as the natural successor of Arbel. He took Arbel's ideas of algebraic functions, intervals, integrals, generalized them systematically laid the foundations of topology in connection with you know, services, uh, and uh, did a lot of other things, of course, as well, following the Euler, the Riemann zeta function. So he, 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 he was the second modern mathematician in my sense. Now, Hamilton is a, is a different, comes from a different school. He wasn't continental, he was an Irish mathematician, uh, and he, but he was a prodigy, infant prodigy. Now, again, some mathematicians start life prodigies, the same thing, some are rather late maturer, let's say. And th if you haven't you know, become famous already at the age of 25, don't worry, there's, there's time yet. And Hamilton was a prodigy. At the age of 11, he spoke 10, 15 languages, including you know, Sanskrit and Greek and Hebrew. And, uh, his father boasted about his son and said, he no, can speak all these languages very fluently, which I think was a bit of a stretching point. <coughs> Uh, there weren't many people to speak Sanskrit to in Dublin. And then he said, well, he's now started on Chinese, and we've had difficulty in getting a good Chinese book in Dublin. So, anyway, he was a prodigy, he spoke all these languages. He also uh, wrote poetry. He, 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 was, he, he was a friend of the poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge. And uh, once day he wrote to Wordsworth, he sent him one of his latest poems. He said he, wanted, he wasn't sure whether he wanted to become a poet or a mathematician. Would Wordsworth advise him? Well, fortunately, Wordsworth gave the right advice. <laughs> <laughs> he said, your poem is quite good, but I will stick to mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> but he was serious about it. He, he did think about the idea. Well, he famous many things. Uh, he first famous predicting what's called conical refraction. Uh, which, if you take Ponko into it, it made his name again. People discovered experimentally what he predicted just a few months afterwards. He became Famous. He was appointed as professor of uh, Royal Astronomer Royal for Ireland before he finished his undergraduate degree. And he held that job for his life. Uh, he became famous later on for of course, Hamiltonian mechanics, because he used foundation also of quantum mechanics. And uh, he also invented quaternions, which uh, I think many people disregarded as a waste of his time and talents. But in fact, in my view, they were not. They were a really Fundamental pioneering discovery, non cumulative algebra came out of them, the groups came out of them, lots of things. And they've now become very fashionable again in terms of modern day physics. Uh, and the, he, there's a famous story about how he discovered the equations of quaternions. He was crossing this bridge in Dublin when suddenly the equations flashed into his mind. And immediately he wrote the equations down on the stone on the bridge. You know, vandalism, graffiti. You put in jail now, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, the, the, the story may not be entirely true, but if you go to the bridge, you'll find the inscription is there, showing he didn't actually do it himself, but he turned it down and somebody else was trapped. Uh, he also, by the way, in a famous paper in 1846, showed the relationship between quaternions to physics, 
Well, you see, he, he noticed that you write down the combination of quaternions with partial derivatives x, y, z, then you square, you get a first order operator, and you square it, gives you the Laplace operator. He said this should have fundamental importance in physics. And that was about 100 years, or nearly 100 years before Dirac discovered the operator, which is now called the Dirac operator, is fundamental in quantum physics. So he's very far sighted. Okay, uh, now you may not be a genius, so you, you should skip over Hamilton quickly because. Uh, now here we get to much more recent here. Lefty says, I didn't mean to meet Lefty, I knew him. Uh, in Princeton, when I first read there, he was a very strong personality. So you tell he was a strong personality. He started life as an electrical engineer. Then in a, in a lab accident, he lost both his hands. Well, that might have put some people off. But in his case, it made it mean clear he couldn't become a practical engineer, so he turned himself into a mathematician. And he became a famous mathematician. So that's, that, that's tough thing. And he had a sort of hook. He hit the days before modern technology. He has a, uh, a, a, a hook on the end that he covered with love. So he couldn't shake hands with it very well. Um, and what, what, what Lefschetz did was take the work of, of uh, Riemann, Marvel, and generalize it to more and more dimensions, more variables, functions of several variables. And he realized that you, when you go from two dimensions to higher dimensions, you need to have much more complicated machinery to understand multiple integrals. And therefore, there was a need to develop a technology, which is what become, became topology. He laid the foundations for topology in, in order to do algebraic geometry and functions of function, simple complex variables, and uh, that became. became he, he was a really pioneer. He spent a lot of his time, uh, before he went to Princeton, he spent his time in Kansas. Now, you may not know that Kansas is a famous place in America, but it's right in the middle of America, way off. I once did a big tour of America, and I described it as a, a circle around the United States, center Kansas City, radius 1,000 miles. <laughs> that way we cover quite a lot of the United States. And he then spent about 12 years in Kansas, very quiet place. In those days it was difficult to get a good job, even if you were somebody like Ashley. Uh, and he did the best time of his life because there was nobody disturbed him. He got on his thinking, he did all his great work there. So isolation for Lefschetz was actually great. Of course, you take that as a pinch of salt. Um, because here we have institutes, now we bring people together, we think that makes great progress. But sometimes isolation is a good, good uh, as a help. Hermann Weyl. Hermann Weyl, um, one of the more contemporary lectures, uh, he was, a, in my mind, view, the, the great mathematician of his era, <coughs> and the one I admired most. He covered a wide range of things in mathematics, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and made fundamental contributions to all of them. But among the all, he was a stylist. He wrote beautiful uh, mathematics in beautiful language. First he wrote in German, and then he wrote in English. And even when he wrote in English, he wrote beautifully. In his book on the classical groups, uh, an introduction which said he apologizes, he has to write in a foreign language until he can make allowances. And the way he puts it is, he says, I have to write in a language not sung by the gods of my cradle. Well, you're a poet like that. Uh, so he, he was a great son, and, and the mathematics is beautiful. He, he, he did it famous for uh, the theory of representation of compact groups uh, and uh, contributions to many other things. He was made a fundamental connection between the vibrations of the mechanical systems, eigenvalues of operators, which is the link between classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, he did an enormous amount. And I did actually meet him once, but meet him is an exaggeration. I was in the audience. Like you all met me, I was in the audience, uh, and uh, back in 1954, I, I was a second year graduate student, like many of you are now, and I went to that conference, and he was giving the address, and he was presenting a field member, there were two field members at the time, the Sarah and I, I heard him talk, and you could tell he was, uh, I, I would have met him, and I went to Princeton the following year, but he just died before I got there. But I did actually have an interesting connection with him indirectly. The US National Academy of Sciences produces memoirs, biographical memoirs of famous people that they die, not only in mathematics, but in all fields. But for some reason, bio is not forgotten or omitted. Well, probably what happened is they asked somebody to write the memoir and the guy went on and on and on, and died, nothing happened. So eventually they asked me, 50 years later. So I had to write an obituary 50 years after the person had died, which is rather unusual. But it had the advantage that you could, didn't have to predict what the work that this person had done and the influence it would have. You could look at the last year and see what it had done. 
And that was great. So you talk about that 50 years, say Herman Bach predicted this, he looked at the first of this. So in a way, it was an interesting exercise. You might like to read it, find out more about it. Now, that was, that was the, the classical group. I better hurry up. Now, I want to move on to the second group, the French school. French mathematics, uh, always great. France was a great center of mathematical centuries past. But in particular, the period after the war, when I was a student, in front is a tremendous flourish. flourish. But before that, let me take you back to one of the founders of the mathematics of the previous era, Henri Cartan. Um, he was the founder of modern differential geometry and many things, also with elite groups. He helped classify elite groups. Uh, he was a very major figure. Um, in the First World War, as you may know, French, a large number of French mathematicians died young and killed in the war. Three quarters or half the best students would die. And so after the war, there was a dearth of French mathematicians. There weren't very many great ones around, but there were two who were regarded as outstanding, who were still there. One was Eric Cartan, who I mentioned, the other was Jacques Hadamard. Um, now, Eric Cartan was famous for his own right, he was probably one of the most famous mathematicians of his era, but his son, Henri Cartan, who looks for you rather similar to him, uh, was equally famous. And he was the leader of the French group after the war. Uh, he talked to Colonel Mar, he had brilliant students like Serre and Marie Tom. Uh, and he developed the global theory of several complex variables, building on the foundations uh, by Leray and so on. Um, he was also, the last person there, I'd like to point out, he was, after the First World War, French transitions totally cold shouldered the German mathematicians. They wouldn't have anything to do with them. And they just, wouldn't allow them to attend congresses and so on. They banished them from the mathematical scene. And this, this went on for years, not just immediately after the war. And it was not until something in the 1920s that Hilbert was able to come to the International Congress leading the German party. But after the Second World War, it was entirely different. And Henri Carson was one of the first French mathematicians to make contact with his German colleagues after the war. And it seemed to be very different, even though Carter's brother was killed by the Nazis and so on. Had a hard time, he was able to make that tremendous deep friendship. Now, Leray was another very important mathematician, French school, contemporary of Carter, Ali, but Ali Carter. He started off life working on fluid mechanics, uh, and he, he studied the state, the Stokes equations. But then, when I said a quirk of fate diverted him in a different direction. What happened was that he was held, he was prisoner of war, put in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, in prisoner of war camps, there's the kind of which they put famous mathematicians, and you, you were cheated reasonably well, you were allowed to run seminars, in courses, and they did. Uh, but uh, Leray decided that if the Germans found out that he was an expert on fluid mechanics, they might put him to use military purposes. He didn't want to work for the Germans producing bombs, so he changed from being very practical fluid mechanics into a totally useless subject, like topology. <laughs> <laughs> and he, 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 that's what he said. So he was totally useless to the German left him alone. And he, while he was prisoner of war, he's almost like left it in Kansas, he developed the two most famous bits of modern topology, theory of sheaves and theory of spectral sequences, which are the foundations of all subsequent work in topology and geometry and so on. Uh, so he did that while he was a prisoner of war. It was a remarkable achievement. Ah, Sarah. Now Sarah was my, almost my exact contemporary. Just a few years older, he's still alive. Uh, and he was the most brilliant uh, mathematician of the French school uh, of the whole, the whole year, and probably the most brilliant mathematician of the 20th century. Um, he, 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 when he was a very early student, he revolutionized both algebraic geometry and algebraic topology. He was following the work of Cartan and Ray, and uh, he got on influential number theory. Uh, so he was a remarkably, I mean, he had shared with Herman Weiler a mathematical elegance that is unsurpassed. What he writes is beautifully written, not only the content, but the style is perfect. Uh, he, he's one of the people I really admire most in mathematics. And then, ah, here we go. Then, uh, more or less at the same time as Sarah appeared on the scene, or just a few years later, came Alexander Grotendieck. 
Uh, Rose Leek was a, a totally different character, a unique character. Nobody I've ever been like Rose Leek before. I can't tell you all about Rose Leek. There's a four-volume biography of Rose Leek being written, part of it to be written, some of it yet to be written by two authors, and it tells you the complete history. His background, his parents were anarchists who fought in the Spanish Civil War and the Nazis. He came to of Russian origin, German origin, educated in France. When I knew him, he was in his heyday as a mathematician. He developed fantastic general ideas in algebraic geometry, with revolution science subject, following on from Serre. Uh, and uh, he had a group of disciples. He, he produced vast amounts of high quality mathematics in a very short period of time. Then he quit. And they, I remember him telling me that uh, one stage, well, he said, well, I'm 40, I'm going to give up mathematics, and I'm going to become a businessman. Well, he gave up mathematics, that was correct, at the age of 40, but he didn't become a businessman. He would have been a disaster as a businessman. <laughs> uh, he became an idealist, you know, with all sorts of idealistic causes, and uh, unfortunately ended up becoming a hermit and a recluse somewhere in the Pyrenees or the Alps. He met, gradually destroyed mathematics and his friends and everybody. It's a, a remarkable story. He had different periods of his life, his background as a refugee in an anarchist family, his studies in France in a great period, but he did in great mathematics, and then his disappearance for the last 40 years into a backward one. And every now and again, let it emerge from the backwards, but he, he simply disappears on the mathematical scene. Now I move on to the Cambridge School. Um, I was a student at Cambridge, and um, of course, Cambridge was great sense of mathematics, and I've selected a few of the people who are influential from my point of view. The first is not a mathematician, but is a physicist, Dirac. Uh, well, Dirac is a famous physicist. He, after Einstein, is probably the most famous physicist of the 20th century. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize very young. He made fundamental contributions to quantum mechanics. He invented the Dirac operator, which is subsequently used by a singer and myself in differential geometry. Um, uh, but he was an unusual man. He was a man of very few words, and very, very many famous stories about the rat and his few words. The one I like uh, is the time he sat with dinner in St. John's College with a young lady sitting next to him. And she said, Professor Dirac, I will take my bet that you will say at least three words to me. He turned to her and said, You will lose. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the idea. Um, he and Hodge. We'll come later. Hodge Hod was my supervisor, PhD supervisor, and he was a Czech contemporary of Dirac. They were the two professors of pure mathematics in Cambridge at the time, uh, two or three, and uh, they both had a connection with St. John's College, uh, and they must have sat on any number of meetings together, but they didn't talk mathematics. They could easily have done. Uh, because Drax's work and Hodge's work uh, different, were made, actually quite close. And my being my living, I was glad they didn't talk. Uh, if they talked to each other, I would have had nothing to do. But the reason they didn't talk was simply that Drax didn't talk to anybody. <laughs> didn't make any distinction from my Hodge or Anyway, that, that's a, a, a set part of the story that came to mathematics. Now, at the same time, Hodge, there was another geometer who like, taught me when I was a student. Uh, or Todd, there he is. A very uh, different sort of man altogether. Todd, you can see his picture with a very genial, friendly, outward going extrovert. Todd was the other way around, very intimate. He, when I used to go to him for his supervisions, when we came to the end of our problems, there would be deathly silence. And the silence would go on for 10 minutes until the supervisor was over. So after the first supervision, I would have been prepared with more work to keep him busy. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, Quite a nice man in his way, he was very, very socially close. He never became a fellow of Trinity College because they didn't like him. But he did, he flourished when he became a fellow of Downing College. Um, and he's famous now for the Todd polynomial, which he invented uh, and played a very important role in the development of algebraic geometry. Now, I'm really going to move on to Roger Penrose, who was my exact contemporary as a graduate student in Cambridge, and he even started working with me in parallel with Hodge. Then he switched to work with Todd. He was now a great geometer in those days. But then we drifted apart, he became a physicist. We met him again in Oxford many years later. Uh, his physics, my mathematics, interacted again. 
So we've been close together. But he, uh, he's a very original um, thinker. I describe him as, as, a, as a, well, prolific author of books on physics and consciousness for the general public. He, 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 uh, he, he produced these non-periodic tilings. You've probably seen the beautiful decoration. The tiling that doesn't repeat. The marvelous, interesting arithmetical properties. He told me he did that while doodling, while visiting a sick friend in the hospital. So you always make use of your spare time if you're a mathematician. <laughs> uh, and they're apparently relevant to things called quasi crystals, which are, you know, crystallography tells you crystals have its own forms, this is my group theory. So there's something called quasi crystals, which, of which the Penrose Tali is an example. And then there's Simon Donaldson. I, I picked these names out of Cambridge's group, they're, they're geometers of various kinds. Hammond Donaldson was my student, so I've done it for the next generation. And he, when he was a second year undergraduate, like many of you are, he discovered something that made him world famous. Uh, and he's gone on since then. Uh, he's, he became a professor at an incredibly young age. Uh, uh, and he, 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 what he did was to revolutionize our understanding of four dimensions. And, you know, four dimensions is a pretty important number. Space time at the four dimensions. And he opened up the door there with totally unexpected and surprising, and probably his discovery, I think, was probably one of the main highlights of 20th century mathematics. There's no question about it. And it's still going on. See, geometers have studied dimension one is hardly geometry, it's just a line or a circle. Dimension two becomes surfaces, Riemann surfaces. It took a century, Arbel, Riemann, and so on, to develop that. Dimension three is much similar to dimension two, but much harder. It was only finally put to rest by famous Russian mathematician Perelman that he solved the famous quaternary conjecture for a while later, a few years ago, and it was entitled to collect a million dollars cash prize. He turned down, being I mean, a very noble mathematician. I'm sure you'll all follow suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the mention four comes after three, and it's very closely connected with three, just like three can be two little links, but it's much deeper, much harder. We are only at the beginning of understanding four-dimensional geometry. That door was opened by Samuel Donaldson. So he opened four-dimensional geometry like Arbel Riemann opened Riemann surface theory. And we've we, we got a, probably 50 years at least to go before we have a good understanding of four-dimensional geometry, which is you know, a remarkable achievement. Now, this is the Russian school. Russia has always had a strong school of mathematics. Lobachevsky, and you're know, back. Uh, but Euler went there, and president in the academy, so a lot of mathematical studies are back. And the Russian school, uh, the ones I came across in my time, the biggest figure think, was Gelsang. There he is. There, that's in, um, in his honorary degree down in Oxford. I managed to get him an honorary de degree in Oxford, and he turned up for it, although technically a bit late. And that was the first time he'd been allowed out of Russia. And I was told, that the only way you could get him out of Russia was to give him an honorary degree. And we looked up people who got honorary degree. When we wrote to the Russians, telling him we telling them we got honorary degree, there were only six Russians who previously had an honorary degree. And the first one was Tchaikovsky. They heard about him, so they let go down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it quite required that kind of effort. Um, his seminar in Moscow was a quite unique affair. It, it attracted students from all over Russia, Moscow. Came from miles away, all sorts of different fields, big crowds. The, the seminar went on for two or three hours in the evenings. It was a, it, he dominated it, uh, and his, when his students went through it, it was a sort of uh, almost it's a kind of it's a kind of prison you have to go through to get out the other side. It was a tough training ground for mathematicians, uh, and he, his influence was he did fundamental work on uh, Barak algebras, uh, and fundamental theorem there, and also the representation of infinite dimensional groups, infinite dimensional knee groups, Helen Barth of the theory of compact groups, uh, Gelfand started with the theory of infinite dimensional groups, did a large amount of work in there which was followed up by Harry Chan and others. Um, so he, he was a remarkable figure and, and all Russian mathematicians, most of them are either disciples or, or they are some disciples and disciples. I'm pointing the wrong way. Yeah. Ah, here we are. Arnold, yes. Um, Arnold uh, was a, a younger mathematician. Gail finally died only a few years ago. Quite, well, he was doing 
of 70. Um, and he was um, probably amongst, now this is not in my time, the only one who was equally um, famous and admired as a pure mathematician and an applied mathematician. He worked in applied mathematics, uh, he did a lot of work on, on uh, creating the fluid, the fluid, and he uh, also developed a theory with Kolmogorov, called the KAM theory, dynamical systems and flows, which is very important for applications to do with the stability of celestial mechanics and things like that. So he did, the, and he did a large amount of work in pure mathematics, opened up the field of symplectic geometry, which turned out very, very fruitful with his conjectures. He was, he was a sort of uh, enormously influential mathematician with very strong views. Many rationalists with strong views, but he was probably the strongest views, and he found them at great length. He didn't think much of American, although he spent a lot of time, mathematical education, for example. Or, or even, well, he, he had strong views on everything. <laughs> I, I occasionally, well, I met him, but we got more friendly, but occasionally, not cross saw, but we exchanged views. <laughs> now, uh, another, another Russian meeting in the queue came in. Why is it going on? Oh, there we go. This is uh, uh, Novikov. Novikov, the young, the young, well, the young girl in Arnold, he's still alive. He got the Fields Medal in the 1970 Congress at the time when he was also not allowed to travel. He wasn't even allowed to travel to get, to get his Fields Medal. So uh, the International uh, Mathematical Union, of which Henri Carter was the president and I was a member, we had a meeting in Moscow about the committee later and we took the medal with us and we gave it to him in Moscow. That was allowed. But he couldn't come to, to receive it in, 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 in Paris. His fundamental work was in topology. Early on, but then shifted, he became a physicist, he attached himself to the Landau Institute, uh, and he did important work in theoretical physics. And in particular, he, he did a lot of study, which is more analysis, on periodic integral systems, in order to call Briand's own and things like things which arise in solid state uh, physics. Now I move on to my collaborators. I mean, oh, what happened there? Yeah, I'm uh, I, I've been very fortunate in, in having a lot of very marvelous collaborators. I, 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 again, I tell you, now this comes many times, I told you, big, short, small, fat, thin, and so on. Uh, and some are solitary individuals who lock themselves in their room, sit there for 10 years, like Perelman, Andrew Wiles, and come out at the end of that period, you know, having proved some famous results. The other ones who are very gregarious, spend all the time talking, having coffee, drinking, going to pub, you know, restaurants, and somehow manage to do their mathematics on the this table while they're discussing it. I'm somewhere near that end of the spectrum. Um, and and Raoul Bott was one of my great collaborators, a uh, great man. Well, that picture there gives you a very fine photograph of him, showing you what he's like. Uh, he's a, he was, a, well, he's a Hungarian. He came, came out of Central Europe. But say in Hungarian doesn't give you the full story. He's Hungarian, he spoke Hungarian, but he lived in, in, in a part of Europe which after the First World War was kept changing hands. Part, part, it was in Slovakia, and uh, some, sometimes he had to go to school and learn Slovak, but it also, he also speaks sort of German. So he spoke every language you could think of in Central Europe before he came to England and America to learn English. So his English was the last of the languages he <coughs> He, he learned that he was he could speak spoke fluent uh, Hungarian, Slovak, German, and so on. Um, and he, he, his contribution was to uh, apply Morse theory, which had been developed by Master Morse, critical point theory, uh, to at the context of Lie groups and derive beautiful theorems about topology of Lie groups using this analysis of Morse theory. Well, the famous of which was his discovery of the famous periodicity theorems, the fact that the Homotopic topology, homotopic groups of the classical groups, the unity groups, or sorry, the symmetric groups, uh, for large values of them, or large matrices, are periodic with periods either two or eight, and then you each case you're in. This was a fantastic discovery because it was totally unexpected and in fact contradicted previous results. And there's a nice story that when there was first contradiction was discovered between Bob's results and results of the other topologists. Uh, Sayer said, uh, well, then controversy was resolved, and Bott proved to be right. And Sayer wrote to French Bott saying, K 
Tell them, ah, what a pity, what a glory would have been for topology to be the first part of mathematics to prove mathematics is inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> like in Cheek Noir. Uh, he was a famous, famous episode. And he, he, he attracted many students because he's such a, he was such a uh, shaggy personality, two of whom, Smale and Cullen, became field medalists. He was, he was a great character, much, much missed by all of us. And then, much more recently, Fritz Hitzler, who died last year, was the person to mean age. We worked together closely. He was a giant figure in German mathematics. Uh, he rebuilt German mathematics after the war, essentially, and after the division of Germany and reunification, he helped to bring Eastern German mathematics into the West. He, he was a, by far the, the most influential mathematician in Germany of his generation. And, uh, and a very nice man at the same time. He achieves things by, not by force or um, arbitrary, but by fi diplomacy, finesse, and being friendly and nice. People didn't realize what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and the best example of that when he organized these famous conferences, the Arbeit Tagen in Bonn, they were meant to be, uh, the conference program was meant to be decided democratically. First day, he would go out and you know, people in the audience, and people suggested talks, whatever was most interesting, and by the end of the, uh, the, the day, the program was decided, the people would take sort of, sort of votes, guided democracy, you might call it, and then we walked out the door, we got the printed program. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, it was a very skillful, very skillful <laughs> And then the, uh, another man I worked with, a very young man, uh, Patoli, very brilliant young Indian, who died, unfortunately, at the same young age, 32, uh, of kidney trouble. He was a very original person. His ideas were sort of, was, we work, I worked with him, but he, he with difficulty understanding how he got his results. He had a certain amount of intuition technique. And in many ways he represents Ramanujan because he died the same age as Ramanujan. He, he came from nowhere. He came to work with people not like Hart. Ramanujan went to work with Hardy. Uh, and uh, so he came to work with Boss. And, things, yeah. and, and then died at a very tragic age. But the ideas were very influential. And many of them taken on by physicists nowadays. Uh, a very sad case. But left the legacy behind him. Oh, now this is uh, my other collaborator, his singer. And this is, uh, I show you, well, he does show his, he and I gave the other prize to King, King of Norway, but that's a good way of showing them together. Um, and singer was a, sort of a third of my collab main collaborators, he and I and Bob, sort of worked sort of more or less around the same collection of problems in different directions over many, many, many years. He's a bit older than me. Uh, I, he came to my 80th birthday, I went to his 85th birthday in the same year. Well, he's 90, I'll be 85. Both of them go, go well, going strongly, perhaps, that we're doing it, but we're still both going. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I did say a bit about mathematical women. I told you that we included in our basic main selection a, a list of um, women mathematicians. And uh, I've chosen a subset here. Um, and but some of them are very well known, some of them are not so well known, some of them are past, some of them are present. Uh, the first one is probably someone you may even not have heard of, Philippa Fawcett. Uh, there she is. Uh, she goes back to the 19th century, and she was a Cambridge student, and the SAT, the, now the Cambridge in those days didn't allow women students, but they allowed them to attend lectures, but they didn't recognize them. They didn't give them degrees. They didn't give them degrees until 1945. My wife was the first to get a degree. Uh, and, uh, but they were allowed to sit the, take the, go to the lectures. They were even allowed to sit the examinations. And they were even placed in order. In those days, the examination results you read, read out in order. You had the senior wrangler, the second wrangler, and so on, all the way down to the junior option, the way down the bottom. Put in, and they read out formally in the study house. Uh, and when the women were allowed to take the examination, uh, they, they would read, they would come down sixth wrangler, and they would say, Miss Smith, between sixth and seventh wrangler, excuse you know I me. Mean? And on this occasion, they, when they started off, they said, above the senior wrangler, Miss Fawcett. She was, she beat the senior wrangler. She was the top woman 
Totally. And then, of course, it's a sensation because the reading of the announcement of the senior wranglers in Cambridge was a big ceremonial event. If you became senior wrangler, you were always guaranteed a job for life and so on. At least for a And uh, people worked very hard to become senior wranglers. For example, Mordell came from America hoping to be the last senior wrangler who stopped the system. Um, and so uh, when he became not senior angler, above the senior angler, the headlines in the New York Times and uh, London Times, front page pictures showing her being carried shoulder high by all the students around, around Cambridge. And she became uh, a famous figure in that right. Of course, she, wasn't, she didn't get an academic job, there weren't academic jobs for women, really. So she went to work, had a distinguished career in education at the London Council. But uh, she became a famous, fam famous family. Uh, father and mother were well, pioneers in women's education, and the Fawcett Society, which supports women's education, is named after her mother. So that's an interesting bit of history which some of you may not know about, but she looked like you can see from the dress, it's not kind of a big period. Uh, now, another woman of, of the same era, contemporary of Philip Fawcett, is Grace Chisholm. Uh, now, Grace Chisholm is a picture there with her husband who was uh, young, William Henry Young. So they, they, they got married, and they both carried on working with mathematicians. Um, that, 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 those pictures are taken by the We managed to get these two pictures independently, put them together. They weren't simultaneous, but what's interesting is the pose is identical. It obviously <laughs> put together. They must have looked at each other. <laughs> what are you thinking of now? <laughs> and uh, I just put them together. I think it's a prize winning. Now they, they worked closely together, and she was the first uh, graduate student in, to get a PhD in Göttingen. Uh, and she was a student of Felix Stein. She married William really Young, who had been her uh, tutor, and they, they, they wrote mathematical things together. But in many cases, the paper was published under his name, because he was the one who could get a job. And the more papers he had under his name, the better job he got. And the job gave the money. They had a family and they had six children. So they had a busy life. Six children, mathematics. So she didn't have an academic job. He had academic jobs, but was very pathetic. He traveled around different places and they all traveled with him. I met now this mathematical family. So they're six children. So she's one became a famous, well known mathematician. Uh, he became a fellow of Trinity. And I met him when he came back for a feast in Trinity when he was 90. And I talked to him, he's in very good shape to work there. And then his, his daughter, uh, Sylvia Vigo, did a professor of mathematics at the University of Nebraska, who I met when I went to Nebraska some years ago. So, the interesting mathematical family. But anyway, this shows from that period, this is what women mathematicians did to make a living. You married a math, math, mathematical husband to give money, or you put yourself an independent job outside the academic world. And, the, and then the third one I've selected is actually. In the audience. I'm sorry to embarrass them, but they had to choose somebody temporary. And there is Mrs. McGuff, who will who lecture you later on. And we had to include her husband as well, because he, you know, he can't divide the picture in half. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a mathematician. So they're, they're a bit like the Chisholm Young. And so Luther has, well, is now, one of the things that Luther is, is a graduate of Edinburgh University. And then she went to Cambridge, a bit like my wife. Who's she then studied in Moscow, and I'm sure she'll be able to tell you about the first hand about the Gelfand seminars. Uh, she came under the influence of Gelfand. I'm quite sure that means exactly. You... <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a powerful personality, let's put it that way. Um, and then she'd be at uh, Stony Brook, and now part of Columbia University. And she's made a lot of interesting work in synthetic geometry connected to the Arnold trajectory, which I mentioned before. Now, but one more special picture to show you. <clears throat> uh, special for two reasons. Well, well you see what the reasons are. There they are. <laughs> there they are. Uh, Churn and Simon. Now, Churn is the, well, I guess you can get the one on the left, obviously. Uh, he's a famous Chinese mathematician who was, uh, came out of China and then went to Princeton in America, spent many years in America, became was the director of the uh, MSRI in Berkeley, 
there was a grant that he returned to China and established an institute in his own university of Tianjin uh, and uh, lived many years in China, a long time. I visited him in China several times and I also visited last year the Chen Institute, which has been named after him. He, he was very influential because he leads a school with all the top Chinese brass of the Deng uh, Min and Zhou Enlai. He, he, he'd been, you know, he, he knew all the top Chinese leaders. He could get money for supporting mathematics. And there's a grand new institute called the Chen Institute, which makes this sort of building look rather small. Uh, and he, now, he, he marks his contributions in differential geometry, which are very extensive. He's a geometer of the old school, but he with a tendency to original ideas in new directions, and he collaborated with many famous people, including Yoko Moza, near Nuremberg, Charles uh, Bott, and so uh, But he, he, he's maybe associated with that Jim Simons. This is why they appear together. Now, Jim Simons is another interesting character. Um, he started life as a different geometer, a friend of Chern's, and one day they wrote a joint paper together on something called Chern Simons, very Chern Simons theory. Uh, and that subsequently became very famous in the physics world, and it was related to the topological invariants of knots discovered by Von Jones, the famous Jones polynomials, uh, and it played a very interesting role in modern uh, theory of physics, modern of string theory and so on, which are built on rather sophisticated uh, parts of geometry, and this, this is one of the sources of that. So, if you're a mathematician, you may not have heard of Chern Simons theory. If you're a physicist, you're almost certain to rule them. Now, after working with Chern, Simons took a different route. He, 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 for reasons which I, he, early on he'd been interested in the business world, but eventually he became a very successful businessman. He set up what's called a hedge fund. You've probably heard about hedge funds. <laughs> and he, he was at one time the best paid hedge fund manager in the world. And his company called Renaissance Technologies uh, generates a vast number of money, and he enabled him to become a very generous philanthropist. I don't know, comparable with someone like Bill Gates. He, 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 he gave money to most of the centers of mathematics. The new center, he called the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics at Sony Brook. Uh, he, he's given $200 million to Sony Brook, he's given $100 million elsewhere. He doesn't give small amounts of money, he gives big amounts of money. Um, well, there was a time, for example, when the, uh, the uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory of Physics, where they have accelerators. Ran out of money. The National Science Foundation didn't have money. They needed a hundred million dollars to keep going. Jim Simon's chipped in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and recently, he set, having set up all these institutes, he has um, set up a fellowship program, which now is, I think, comparable, it almost exceeds the number of fellowships offered by the National Science Foundation. So he's a big time plan. So we need more of them. So if you don't become a successful mathematician, become a successful businessman, don't forget your friends in the university. <laughs> uh, they, they'd be very glad to make a picture of you and put you on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd have to put Jim Simon on, on, the, on the screen there to show that you, know, you, you can... But he did, well, he, he did some good mathematics as well, and now he's retired from his financial company. Uh, he, he's gone back to being, doing mathematics. He's just on paper with his dentist Sullivan. He, like, he has mathematics more fun, really. Than Making money. If you made as much money as he has, you can take a photo and take that view. <laughs> uh, anyway, he's a nice, he's a nice guy, and he, he's uh, this, this Simon Center. By the way, Simon Donaldson just moving to the Simon Center study book from, um, which, which is a, doing the kind of geometry that he, he embodies. Anyway, there you are. That, that's the uh, picture gallery, a selection, subset. Only 20 out of 70 will go on. So go and admire it, press the button. You'll get these uh, texts. Uh, I should say that the texts are not good from the Wikipedia. That's why the selection of mathematicians are a personal choice. The text is a personal choice of mine. I, I mean, I wrote them personally. <laughs> a few facts here and there that I've heard about. And they're based on my, my own personal knowledge and my own personal interpretation. And every now and again, I've put in a few remarks indicating I didn't really approve of the guy, but I mean, 
you wouldn't find, you couldn't put that in Wikipedia without being sued. <laughs> but usually the people like make this about are already dead. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I thought it was much more interesting to have really personal remarks and give you some flavor of the ca character. It was just bland statements, great man, all that sort of thing. So, if somebody was a controversial figure, could be Arnold, I, I, I didn't hesitate to put that in. So when you read these texts, look at the fine detail, and you'll find some interesting bits in there, which <clears throat> I didn't explain in full detail, you have to sort of search to get the full explanation. And now, by the way, I should say that <clears throat> Peter Reed, the girl who did that, that was like the gallery, totally fully functional now, the intention is that that gallery will become more, <clears throat> will be added to. When you press these buttons, you now get the short text in the future, you may be able to press the button and get a whole article, where we'll be put more resources into it. It's designed to be um, <clears throat> interactive for the future, we can get, and if you press a one button, for example, you, if you do that now, you can get a picture of all the women mathematicians. Or you might want to put a button and get this whole field of metal, or whatever you like. This is different subjects can appear, from the Russian world. And this is going to be worked on and it'll become more and more exciting. So anyway, I, I think we, we, we who worked on this gallery are quite pleased about it. We think it's an interesting addition to the, and it can compare quite well, quite favorably with the physicists down below. Ah, oh, there's more advanced technology, and 10 years later, the electronics is better. Uh, for example, I think, when that, what happened when you have a big collection of uh, pictures like that, every now and again, a bubble goes, oh, the whole thing falls down, goes dark, you have to wait for something to come next week, freeze it up. Not so with this setup. If something <laughs> the bubble goes, it's in the email. Back <laughs> 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 comes the answer, and hope, oh, presto, and only that one goes anyway. So it's designed to be, Self, you know, only smart system prepares itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so enjoy the enjoy these pictures, and uh, uh, I hope you all become great mathematicians, one kind or another. And uh, don't forget, if you become rich, oh, I should say yes. Besides becoming rich this way, there's another way to become rich. There's a, and I went well, many years ago. I became a, <clears throat> I got the Chern professorship in California to give some lectures. Chern was a man mentioned down there. Uh, um, and in this chair, Chern Fisher, was founded, funded by a philanthropist. Not by a scientist, this was before that. But no, no, by a, a man who won the California State Lottery. He got $22 million. Uh, he got it only uh, in installments. He got $1 million a year for 20 years. But never mind. <coughs> and then, with a bit of that money, he founded this visiting Fisher. Uh, Chern summoned to go and give the lectures for a few years. And I got that. Now the interesting thing is, <clears throat> when he was he was a student at Berkeley, he did mathematics. When he came to want to move on to graduate work, he applied to Berkeley, and they turned him down. They thought he wasn't good enough. <laughs> so what did he do? He went along to church. He was a very friendly, nice man. And church said, "Well, we should give the guy a chance." So he allowed him to get the persuaded his colleagues that he'd have it. So he got on. He got his PhD, and he went down. He did quite well in computer business. But he remembered the churn was his friend. So when he got his money, he was called the Churn Professorship. So remember, the professors, when you have your graduate students, don't forget they might become wealthy businessmen, you might have a lot of million dollars. Be friendly with them. Okay, thank you. Inspired, really directly. I, I got sort of inspired 
by my collaborators, young men, you know, say people below me will be up to early mathematics. I found that enormously um, intimidating. I don't think I was any. When I was at school, I had a good maths teacher who was, I suppose, inspiring in a sort of way, but I don't think I would put it down to any particular uh, person inspiring me. But uh, I, I had good teaching, I had good students, I had good. Uh, my lectures were, uh, the lectures were brilliant, but they, 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 I learned some mathematics. <laughs> More questions? I don't be shy. Uh, let's see. We have one more man. We have one from the woman's work. You call it the opportunity on that. <laughs> no? No? Ah, you know. Oh yes, of course, of course. As I said, they are even from my original list. I suddenly remembered I left out one of my friends. And, you know, and, uh, then I was trying to inject it very hard. And a lot of other people I could have added, I could make another list. I mean, but these are all people who are close to me in some mathematical sense. If I extend that boundary a little bit, back in time or in space or in field content, I can double that number easily. Yeah, I mean, we could certainly. It's meant to be a sample, not just one of them. But it includes quite a few good people. I mean, no question of money. I think, I, you know, like all people, you, you tend to think you lived in a golden age. When I was young, you know, it was a great era. I'm sure everybody was the same. Their, your era is that's the best era you want. Your friends are the best friends. And certainly, my era, period of the, the mathematics, the acquisition around Sarah, Burton, G. Kitzel, all looked to me like you know, great figures. Uh, I still do, but uh, sometimes it's this distortion of perspective. You, if people come along with different perspectives, different ideas, I mean, but occasionally you're lucky. I mean, I think I was lucky because I came just after the war, uh, and, and the war had disturbed the education of many people. So when I was, for example, when I went to Princeton with my PhD, it was a conglomeration of people who were as many years apart, bought a singer five years older than me, they'd done. Uh, uh, well, Singer had been in the Navy, <coughs> and then there was Sarah in France. I mean, there was, there was, we, we, we were a big collection which, which all came into some years because of the disturbance of the, the war in and, and Britain. You get a very particular history. So, uh, in that sense, it was an unusual um, period. Uh, I'm not sure that other unusual periods around the East, and we have wars, of course. But, so, uh, Um, of the 70 mathematicians, obviously some of them aren't in your field that you're related to. So how do you know that they're, they're any good at what they do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reputation's spread, you know. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the people, there are some, I mean, for example, I included in that field over there, people like uh, von Neumann and uh, um, um, oh, 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 my name, complex. Uh, Alan Turing, yes. So, I did, of course, I didn't know. Uh, but my man I almost knew, he was still alive when he was dying, but I knew why he was indirect. I, I, I read some of the long numbers work, his work has overlapped some of mine. Turing, uh, uh, not, I didn't overlap. He was very different, but you know, his influence on mathematics, logic, computing was so clear from the question. Uh, and this year would be 17, and he would be even more famous. Uh, others, um, I think most of you will like I mentioned there are, are people who's, uh, everybody knows about Euler, who are quite useful, so that's a sort of automatic, even coming further down, um, I think all of those people with mathematics have had an impact, you know, interacted with some way. Not well, my main work, but you can't, some people are so broad that they, they cover large areas. Hard to be unaffected by them, but it, it, I think I, it, all those are meant to be designed to show that the variety of mathematicians covers the variety of areas, variety of types. All of these things are different, so it, it's a good thing to emphasize that mathematics is human activity made by people, and the people are different. And that this is not all uh, people outside think all mathematicians are nerds, or they're all essentially you know, can't people who can't do their shoelaces. Well, that, that's not true. Uh, and there's a lot of varying as other people, and uh, that's quite a variety. If we're all the same, we all produce the same kind of mathematics. 
that be a single track. Fortunately, we're not. The more variety there is of people, the wider the kind of mathematics, the wider the original ideas, and the healthier it is. So we want to encourage diversity in all ways. Okay, so just thank, thanks so much again.